It's one of the world's greatest engineering wonders. The Great Wall of China. They say it can even be seen from space. It's a military masterpiece that has witnessed hundreds of battles. Yet it still holds many mysteries. British writer and historian William Lindsay has lived in China for 20 years. Exploring the Great Wall has become his lifetime obsession. Lindsay has spent thousands of days on the wall, has walked thousands of kilometers along it. How long is the Great Wall, really? How many years did it take to build? And why was it built at all? <laughs> <laughs> it's only a short trip from Beijing to one of China's most popular attractions. Millions of tourists come here every year to see the Stone Dragon, the Great Wall of China. Most of the people walking on the Great Wall here today will go home and say, I've been to the Great Wall of China. But the Great Wall is not a place. It ranges across the subcontinental expanse of North China. And along its course, many of the locations are seldom visited and some are virtually unknown. In 1987, Lindsay fulfilled his childhood dream. He walked on the Chinese Wall, 2,700 kilometers. Only a few pictures remain from this adventure because his films were repeatedly confiscated. Foreigners were barred from many parts of China. Those times have long changed. China has opened up to the world, and an adventurer has turned into a scholar. Lindsay now seeks out traces of the Great Wall of China right across the country. 23 years after his first trip, he sets off again. Doing the same, exploring 23 years later is really testament to the immensity of what we call the Great Wall of China. In the last two and a half decades, I explored the wall more, 1,700 days. I've discovered it's the world's most famous building, but the least known. There's always something new to discover. There it is. There is no single Great Wall. There are lots of walls in northern China, built by different dynasties for more than 2,000 years. William Lindsay is taking us to one of the most remote places, a 2,300-kilometer drive west of Beijing, to the city of Dunhuang. Into the Gobi Desert. Well, I'm nearly there, 75 miles northwest of Dunhuang. And uh, it's a nice sunny day in the Gobi Desert, perfect conditions for exploring the Great Wall. In the shimmering heat, the dark ribbon along the horizon at first looks like a mirage. But these really are the remains of a wall, literally in the middle of nowhere. Well, one of the most precious parts of the Great Wall of China, this is the Han Wall, built 2,100 years ago. And I'm not the first traffic to come here. This is the Silk Road. So merchants would come from the deserts in Central Asia, entering China at this point, and then proceed east to the heartland of China. So let's go and take a closer look. Built over 2,000 years ago, this wall looks completely different to the familiar Great Wall near Beijing. It's not built of stone, but this construction material has kept it strong for millennia. Reed and gravel. But who was this wall meant to protect so far from civilization? 
the Han Dynasty rulers wanted to open their empire to trade with the West. So they secured control of the eastern end of what became known as the Silk Road. The Han Chinese occupied the vital Heishi Corridor that runs along the Silk Road between the northern steppes and the Himalayan foothills. It's a real border, not just between peoples, but between lifestyle. The nomads of the steppe live in yurts, the traditional round tent. They live entirely from their livestock, wandering over the steppe. They pitch their yurts wherever they find grazing land for their herds. After enduring long, hard winters in the steppes, these nomadic warriors ransack China's northern provinces. Year after year, they kill and maraud, stealing food and metals, everything their lifestyle prevents them producing. The Chinese regarded their empire as the cradle of civilization. According to their Confucian philosophy, it was the cultural center of the world. Appeasing the barbarians along the border by trading with them was out of the question. War was too expensive, so the Han Emperor decided to build a wall. How many people were involved in the construction of the Han Wall? No one knows for sure. Reliable sources quote the calculations presented to the Emperor. If one soldier can build three paces of wall in one month, then 300 men can build three li, about one and a half kilometers. That means a 1,000 li, or about 530 kilometers, would take 100,000 men one month to complete. So far, so good. And so many. Most of the soldiers were stationed at the towers. The towers had a dual use that made them most effective for defense. The beacon tower behind me was not only the perfect vantage point for guards on this frontier to watch for the enemy coming from the north, it was a signaling station. So when the enemy was sighted, this beacon would have been ignited. This is how it worked. As soon as a guard spotted nomadic warriors, he transmitted smoke signals by daylight or beacon fires at night. The alarm was communicated along the wall to garrisons located in the hinterland. How long is the Han Wall? Only recently have Chinese experts started to find out. We've joined the local archaeological um, survey team who are taking part in a national survey to locate the line of the Han Dynasty Great Wall. The team is heading out into the Gobi Desert. They need a whole summer just to measure this section of the wall. At noon, the temperature can climb to over 40 degrees Celsius. Today, the team is exploring a fortification that lies in the hinterland of the Han Wall. This could have been a garrison for support troops. Today, the remains are hardly visible. This uh, tower has a name, it's called Half Tower, obviously because half the tower is missing. The, the team are here today to locate the fortifications with GPS. I'm wondering how they're going to measure the height because it's so crumbly, I'll ask them. Uh, Oh. Oh. So they don't have to, have to climb up the tower to measure it. They have a, a device here. A laser rangefinder collects the data. It'll be a few years before the results of the survey are summarized and a figure can be given for the length of the Han Wall. So from here to the Jade Gate is about 45, 50 kilometers. And there are three sections of wall that are quite visible. And in between, there's virtually nothing, although the archeologists may find traces. Uh, Mr. Yang is very reluctant to give a guesstimate of how many kilometers of Han Wall are standing.
PS team leader Mr. Young has given William directions to a place in the desert where the wall has a unique shape. It's a 16-kilometer hike, so William is buying provisions for the trip at Dunhuang Market. Well, um, raw meat wouldn't be very good ants in the deserts. A lot of what he sees doesn't seem too useful for a desert trek, but he finally finds what he needs. Successful shopping trip for $1.99 or so, a good supply of high energy foods. Mmm, delicious. Next morning at five o'clock, Lindsay sets off for the hike. Lots of satellites around. Uh, it's 14.4K. So it's about uh, nine, nine, nine miles or more. He's not walking alone. And, uh, do... In the desert, it would be too dangerous. With him is his Chinese friend, Piao Tiejun. The sun coming up there. Yeah. Their GPS says they will reach the unique strip of wall in five hours. Let's go. It's cool now, but the sparse vegetation is tinder dry. There hasn't been any rainfall here for months. They're walking in a featureless landscape. You can see a solitary tree over there. I just had a big map of the whole country. Basically, my journey along the wall from the desert to the sea was like that. 1,700 miles. Not the ideal map for hiking across desert grassland. It's nearly noon, and the sun is burning. But finally, they arrive at the place they've been looking for. Hey, there it is. We made it. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Great. <laughs> Brilliant. For William, it's already worth the trip, even the five hours back. Amazing, eh? Oh, look at that. Fantastic. Of all the faces that the Great Wall of China has, this is the rarest of them all. This wall is made of wood. See, there's six layers of branches there. And, and in between, minimal use of the gravel. So I'm really glad I've come here today. Well worth a 10 mile trek. Leaving the Dunhuang region and making his way east along the ancient Silk Road, William is aiming for a town called Jiayuguan. The historic site is five kilometers out of town. And the best view is from the sky. A giant castle guarding the wall, built in 1539 by Jia Jing, emperor of the Ming dynasty. The Ming emperor's contempt for the nomads reached grotesque proportions with the demand that the character Ji, standing for barbarians, should be written as small as possible. After the Han Dynasty, other dynasties rose and fell. Many of them built walls, but none of any significant length. 
Ming Emperor Jia Jing ascended the Dragon Throne in 1521. He renewed the Han tradition established in ancient times, constructing a long wall at the northern border with its westernmost point at the Jiaoguan Pass. Jiaoguan translates as barrier to the Pleasant Valley, and Pleasant Valley means China. This gigantic fort is built in the foothills of the Himalayas. In the courtyard, the mighty walls form a kind of maze to stop invaders in their tracks. And there's a wonderful legend about its construction. To avoid wastage of materials prior to construction of the fortress, the architect was asked to calculate exactly how many bricks were required. He computed 999,999. The bricks were delivered, the fortress built, and at the end, the chief of works confronted the architect with a brick and said, this is wasted. But the architect was too smart. He said, no, I factored that into the equation. That brick should be placed over the portal and it will bring all the guards in the fortress and all of those travelers passing under its portals good fortune. 600 years later, the leftover brick still remains. Next to the fort is the starting point of the wall constructed by the Ming. This wall has nothing in common with the brick and stone wall north of Beijing. It's made of rammed earth, and although it's more than 400 years old, it's still in good shape, and it's still wide enough to walk on. walks along the walls, William Lindsay soon learned he could count on receiving warm hospitality from the farmers along the way. Before coming to China, my family and friends were very concerned. You know, 1987, going to China, the big communist country on the other side of the world, are the people going to be friendly? And I didn't have a support crew with me, I depended on farmers. I discovered very early on the farmers were my great allies, even with very little Chinese, but a lot of sign language and smiling. I got what I needed, food, water, shelter. Without them, I couldn't have been successful. Even if many of them can't understand why a foreigner should be so interested in the wall. For them, this is no monument, but simply a part of their village and one with a perfectly practical use. I was asking him why are these holes in the wall. I thought they were nests, but in fact, um, previously the farms were right up against the wall, so there were wooden beams going into the wall. But uh, the Great Wall experts, the Cultural Heritage Protection Authorities, uh, requested the farmers to uh, destroy those buildings and move back in order, in order to protect the national heritage. If you want to know how Ming Dynasty masons constructed their wall more than 400 years ago, all you have to do is keep your eyes open. Even today, Chinese farmers build walls in the same way their ancestors did. They tamp the earth in a wooden casing. Tamp, put layer on layer. They even sing the traditional folk songs passed down from their forefathers. A house is not complete without a wall around it, says an old Chinese proverb. My friend Chen is building this wall to enclose his compound. So this is the final piece of work. And um, this is embedded in Chinese architectural tradition. 
Whether it's a compound or a village or a kingdom, it must be enclosed, completely safe. They built most of the Ming Wall just like this, is a rammed earth wall. Imagine how many billion thuds it took. So, this <laughs> work, you sing, you sing, this is very good. This is the one you sing, or... Yes, it's very good. The singing is an important part of the work. It keeps all the rammers in stat, uh, the beat. Uh, so, you know, they're all in stat going along the wall there. They get into a rhythm. And um, the actual content, oh, <laughs> I've been in China 23 years, but this guy has a really heavy accent. It's a bit difficult. But uh, it's definitely a kind of rap. He changes the words and occasionally you hear them chuckle. So I think he gets a little dig in about those that are kind of falling behind in distance. Or maybe he can tell by the thuds if someone is out of tune. This group of about 20 farmers, mostly women, took a day to erect about 27 meters of wall. We don't know if their ancestors could have worked better or faster. But we do know they would have used the same materials and tools, except for the tractors carrying the clay and the cell phones. Hold on, hold on, go ahead, hold on. Hold on. On his journey along the walls of China, William Lindsay is walking eastwards, out of the Heixi Corridor and turning north along the Great Wall of the Ming Dynasty. Into the Great Loop of the Yellow River, the cradle of China's civilization. This has always been the gateway for the nomads to enter China. Here, though wind and weather have done their worst, the wall and its towers can still be made out on the crags above the river. The garrison forts were the outposts of this defensive outer wall. Today, their use is strictly non-military. staying in the countryside. This uh, building, it's made of thick blocks of limestone and on the roof there's turf. When you come here in winter, they've got a good method for keeping you warm. See this? It's not a bed, it's called a can, K-A-N-G. And uh, they uh, put the uh, fuel under here, light it, they can do the cooking here, and you've got a nice warm bed for the night. So, I've got uh, Full board and lodging, um, breakfast tomorrow morning and uh, dinner this evening and lunch coming up soon for less than ten dollars. I 
黄瓜。<笑>
or an old archive document. And he helps William translate the ancient Chinese characters, which today hardly anybody can read. This stone is telling us that two military officials in charge of 1,100 families put in the effort to build 250 yards of wall in the autumn of 1579. So in terms of very simple uh, arithmetic productivity, we're talking about four persons per family, uh, 4,500 people working for eight to 10 weeks in the autumn of 1579 mm. to build that. Whereas tamped earth walls were built by untrained serfs or peasants, this project required special knowledge. Hundreds of master builders and skilled engineers, thousands of stone cutters and tens of thousands of masons were recruited to build the wall. And another factor led to the costs rising exponentially. Tamped earth walls were built using materials available on site. The material for the new wall had to be manufactured before use. The Chinese had devised a network of brick kilns set up near the construction sites. One of these sites was found by local farmers and inspected by Professor Wang Tsunu, curator of the Great War Museum in Shanghiguan. So at this location, they discovered uh, around 60 brick kilns, and it ranks as the uh, best uh, production center of bricks uh, preserved along the whole length of the Great Wall. And uh, it's estimated that uh, each kiln uh, could fire 5,000 bricks. Now, given that there are 60 kilns in this valley, the production of this center alone would be equal to 3,000. 100,000 bricks per month, industrial scale production. Then as now, mass production is one thing, but it's a different matter to transport the product to where it's needed. Logistics. Now, key question, very interesting question is, how did they move all the bricks up there? Again, there is almost no historical record to answer this question. But Professor Wang has his theory. People may have carried a few bricks on their backs like this. Uh, and also it's been suggested a herd of goats could have uh, carried a lot of bricks up there quite effectively. Uh, two bricks on the back of the goat, and the bricks are joined together uh, with rope, so the goat is quite balanced as it's moving up the mountain. Even without bricks on your back, it's a hard slog up to the wall. But it's worth it. Hardly any tourists make it to this isolated section. Every time I come up here on these trails, I spare a thought for the builders who had to heave, push all of this building material up here, all these blocks, all of these bricks. The sometimes bizarre route taken by this wall has led many experts to believe that more than just defensive considerations were in play here. For generations, the Chinese had followed the practice of feng shui, the teachings of wind and water. Feng Shui experts were probably consulted and obeyed before the building of the wall to make sure that the forces of nature would work in its favor. Spending his days alone on the wall, 
Lindsay imagines how the soldiers must have suffered here. Cut off from the world, enduring winds and foul weather, squeezed into bare and cramped quarters for months on end. Finally, this wall is a monument to the closed world view of the Ming Empire. It circumscribed their universe and excluded everything that was foreign. Often scratching around in this rubble, you can find bits of pottery. Um, not sure what this stone is. This stone looks quite interesting. Maybe a brick on it. Let's have a look. is a stone bomb that would have been packed with gunpowder, a mud seal, a fuse, and the towers like this was, were just packed with these, maybe 50 or 100, to be lobbed off the wall when the tower was attacked. So that's a really good find. Three hundred and twenty kilometers further east, we find another example of living history. This is Zhang Hershan. His ancestors built the wall here four hundred and forty years ago, and uh, close by. Towers have other family names like the Chen Tower, the Wang Tower, the Law Tower. So we're here we have the family history of the Great Wall still living on 440 years after it was built. Even today they still worship their ancestors by celebrating ancient festivals. Ah, there they are. The pig was slaughtered yesterday, so it should be quite nice, fresh pork. It would have been a rare moment of relaxation and abundance in a hard life. As the oldest member of his family, Mr. Zhang makes the sacrifice to his ancestors and burns incense sticks. Then the living generations of the Zhang family bow to the dead and to their own great history. The village families had to look after and feed the soldiers in the towers. Their takeaway food service survives to this day. Uh, Zhang Hushan, the farmer down in Chengziu village, prepared some delicacies for me to munch on up here after my hike. And it's amazing to think that 400 years ago, guards garrisoned up on the wall would be sent these, Polo being, by their families. So let's have a look. It's a kind of pasty kept fresh in one of these large oak leaves. You can even see the leaf prints on the pastry. Well, have a taste. Mmm. Full of chives. Kind of Chinese hamburger. Maybe the original Chinese takeaway for those up on the wall.
by 1644, just short of a hundred years of construction, the most impressive defensive wall ever made by man was finished. However, it was not one single great wall. It comprised a system of several defense lines, from the mountains to the sea. In 2009, after a national survey of the Ming Wall, Chinese officials announced that the total length is 8,850 kilometers. This is the end at Shanghiguan, meaning Mountain Sea Pass. The Chinese liken the Ming Great Wall to a dragon snaking across their land. And here it comes to a geographical end at Old Dragon's Head at the Yellow Sea. Not far from this location, in 1644, the commander of Shanghai Guan faced his biggest challenge, an event which led to the end of the Great Wall functioning as a national defense. Professor Wang is taking William to the gates and walls in the outskirts of Shanghiguan. This is the place where the Great Wall story came to an end. The construction of the Great Wall led to the financial and strategic collapse of the Ming Dynasty. Revolts broke out everywhere in the empire. An army of rebel peasants marched on Beijing where they toppled the emperor. Then on to Shanghiguan, the last stronghold of the Ming Empire. But a mighty army had risen from the steppes, heading for the Middle Kingdom, the Manchus. Caught in between, Wu Sangui. He was the general in command of the fortress at Shanghiguan. Now he was under siege. What could he do? This was a powerful garrison, but was it strong enough to fight off attackers on two fronts? Mm. Professor Wang Tsunung tells William Lindsay the solution he found. So trapped between two enemies, Commander Wu Sangui knew he couldn't defeat them both, so he came up with a plan to offer an uh, alliance treaty with the Manchus in the north. And the two armies joined and confronted the peasant rebel army, and they defeated them. A wall is only as strong as the men who guard it, Genghis Khan is supposed to have said. His successors from the steppes, the Manchus, would have agreed with him. 80,000 Manchu soldiers passed through this gate and entered the heartland of China. The Manchus founded a new dynasty which in effect ruled over the Middle Kingdom until 1912. They called themselves Qing, meaning the pure. And the Great Wall was of no use anymore. But its story did not come to an end. Even today, nobody knows how long all the Great Walls of China really are. There are still many more walls and stories to be discovered. And William Lindsay will not stop walking the Great Wall until he knows them all. I don't think in future so many people will be organized in such a methodical way to create something that was not just history, that not just fell apart, but is left as part of the geography of China and the world. Certainly in future there are going to be new wonders, there are communications, longer life, exploring planets, but in terms of blood, sweat, and tears, the Great Wall of China, I think, is the ultimate, and that's why I'm continuing to understand it.